uh, good morning. Um, we uh, are talking about um, how we assess peripheral circulation. I will present some stuff and Jacques will be critical. Um, as you know, Jacques is from Erasme. I'm from Erasme in Rotterdam and um, I was at Erasme a long time ago as well. Um, peripheral circulation. So my first question is what, who of you assesses peripheral circulation regularly on a patient at first contact. So you're asked to come and see a patient and one of your things is assess, that's four people? Five, six. Five, six. <laughs> okay, oh, we have work to do. Okay, um, and what instruments do you use? Okay, and, and, yeah. Devices? Anyone uses devices? Temperature? Temperature? Yeah. A blood gas. Oh, that's interesting because I always forbid take any blood gas in acute care. Usually messes up your whole idea about the patient. <laughs> and then in the United States, <clears throat> they only do ve uh, venous blood gas. So who's interested in a venous blood gas. So it's a little bit difficult, but can you explain why you think a blood gas will tell you something about the peripheral circulation? Well, it's a compound picture with everything as a puzzle piece and with a blood gas, I can get a sense of what the blood Oh, is. You, you use it in combination. Ah, okay. Uh, that's a little bit outside of the scope of the presentation. We will skip the whole metabolic assessment and blood pressure and stuff like that. This is only peripheral. Okay, uh, remember that if you use an instrument, I mean, you have to use it right. <laughs> and I mean, this is free. I mean, George Bush was not a very bright guy, but um, <laughs> uh, if you look at this, he was definitely not a, a bright guy. But I've seen many people using an instrument um, where they have no clue how the instrument works. They're looking for a number. The instrument doesn't give a number. That's, for instance, pulse oximetry is a very nice example. Uh, when you walk into a room in a, a, where someone is in trouble, we have this rapid response team, and you see a pulse oximeter here, here, and in this hand, and on that hand, you know the patient is in trouble. You don't need to see the patient anymore because they didn't find a signal and they don't understand that there is no signal if there is no perfusion uh, in the periphery. So um, it's a very important uh, element. Okay, which instrument do you use? I already hand, so touch. The first uh, response was sight. Uh, there's a little bit of hearing, um, that's of course not peripheral perfusion, but <coughs> if you see a very confused or you hear a very confused patient, that's of course a perfusion, could be a perfusion uh, element. But the, the, most, uh, the two most important things is sight and touch. So look at the patient and touch the patient. Now, in, in some cases, this is not even necessary. Just looking at the patient is already telling you a lot. Um, I frequently tell the story how Professor Inche became interested in microcirculation under the tongue because he was an engineer. He was not doing anything in microcirculation, but he was in the academic medical center in, in Amsterdam. And he would round with the intensivist. And uh, what we do in, in, in the Netherlands is we feel temperature um, of uh, extremities. And so what he observed is intensivists would walk into the room, lift the sheet, and put his hand under the sheet. And he was like, what the hell are you doing there? And, and uh, the doctors were like, yeah, feel the peripheral temperature. Yeah, why would you be interested? And then, of course, the whole discussion about microcirculatory perfusion. And that's how he uh, got interested in, um, in the microcirculation. So sight is sometimes... Uh, telling you everything, like for instance, uh, and, and that's all stuff. Uh, don't think that you're doing something revolutionary, like, wow, this group of, uh, of doctors in the Netherlands started to investigate uh, <coughs> peripheral circulation a few years ago and did an Andromeda study and showed that it makes sense. 
Uh, this is old stuff. This is a painting from 1805. That's decades ago. And of course, the painter of, of this was not on the ship. And while Nelson was dying, he was drawing. So they told him what was happening, and he used a picture that he knew from, let's say, maybe experience or whatever. And so what he paints is the dying of Lord Nelson. And of course, this was traumatic injury, uh, hemorrhage. Um, and, uh, and all these people around him have these bright red faces. And only Lord Nelson is completely white. So already at 1805, they knew that if you die from bleeding, in most of these cases, of course, then you turn pale. Uh, so there's nothing new about uh, peripheral uh, circulation. And if, yeah, the, the colors on the screen are a little bit uh, difficult. But if you see something like this, this discolored skin with these dark blue uh, areas on a hand, or you have this very pale white, um, this is the hand of the doctor, this is the hand of the patient, or if you, ha oh. or if you have these discolorations, on the extremities, the, in this case the knees, mean um, I don't need the blood pressure. I mean, who cares about the blood pressure? If, if the patient is breathing and there's a heart rate, I mean, if the heart rate is slowing down with something like this, then you know you're in CPR mode within minutes. Um, but the, the risk of, of this patient is huge. So let's say we have given these patients uh, a first fluid resuscitation in the emergency room, and then they call you, and you see this. What's the average mortality? Global. Sorry? Yeah, 50 to 60 percent. So you're, you're already dealing with someone who has a low likelihood of surviving, whatever the numbers. Um, and so just looking at the patient uh, can tell you already a lot. Do you do that, uh, Jacques? Yeah, yeah, of course. And you, you said that who cares about the mean and the pressure? I, I, I always agree with you. That. I agree with you. Uh, but because this is an alert signal, this 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 thing. An alert signal. You know. But on the other hand, if you want to correct it, you need to have mean and the pressure. Because if you want to correct this. It will depend at what mean arterial pressure is the patient, because you will consider probably giving fluid, increase the cardiac output, decrease probably mean arterial pressure because it's too high, or try to give some vasodilator. So don't neglect mean arterial pressure. Oh, no. It is, it's <laughs> no, it, it's not like, but if someone is trying desperately to get okay. the blood pressure, okay, right. let's focus on something else first, <laughs> okay. you know? Because... What if you measure a normal blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Then what? So I had this case of a, a patient. I walked into the emergency room. Um, it was a guy with two broken legs. Um, and I said, this patient is in trouble. And they said, no, 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 the blood pressure is 130 over 90. Yeah, yeah, but he's dying. <laughs> he was dead uh, 10 minutes later. So if, if you have a young patient with a very active sympathetic nervous system, they can create a lot of blood pressure. It's, it's like Duracell batteries. I mean, they're like this and then boom, they're gone. Whereas elderly paper, uh, patient goes something like this. And so even if you have a normal blood pressure, it, it can completely confound your, let's say, treatment of the patient. And so blood pressure is always... If you have no blood pressure, you're dead. So that's easy. You need a blood pressure. Um, but if you want to assess risk, so can I walk out and have a coffee and then return in 15 minutes? No, you, you don't leave this room anymore. Uh, so that's basically what I meant with I'm not interested in blood pressure. This is emergency and you don't leave. Uh, <clears throat> that's what I tell my residents and fellows in the United States. The, the system is completely different. You round on patients, and so you round, and then you make a decision, and then you move on to the other. <clears throat> and in the beginning, uh, residents or fellows would walk out on a patient like this. They would tell the nurse, like, give a liter of fluids. And the nurse would prepare, and then they would walk out. Now, are you kidding? You, 
you don't leave a patient like this. You stay there until you fix the problem. Uh, um, and sometimes it takes four hours to fix the problem. Well, then you're there for four hours. Um, so looking at the patient or looking at the skin in this case uh, can already give you a lot of information. And it's basically one of the uh, pillars of shock. Uh, Max Hariwal, a long time ago, already defined the, uh, the elements of shock. <clears throat> and so this is not new at all. Um, he already said altered tissue perfusion is an element of, uh, of shock. And of course, the arterial uh, hypotension and uh, the main thing of uh, Max Hariwal, the, the increased blood lactate, on the basis of microcirculatory abnormalities. But he already said altered tissue perfusion um, as a signal, like for instance, uh, uh, low urine output, which is of course incredibly difficult if a patient is admitted to the emergency room who, who knows what the uh, urine output is. Uh, but he already said altered mentation, uh, so that's hearing, uh, listening to the patient, and mottled clammy skin were uh, the characteristics of, um, of shock for Max Hariwal when he started in the 60s. Huh? Um, so that's a long time ago. <coughs> and if you want to have an, um, let's say, idea about what are, um, what's, what am I dealing with here, um, this is the study from I2 Fella, very simple, looking at a modeling score that he uh, calculated. A modeling score is, is basically how uh, extended is the modeling, and, and so only the knee or the whole leg. And so if you have the majority of the leg um, with a color like this, and you compare it to only this, there's a 74 time increase in mortality. Um, and so only the realization that the patient with this is something completely different than a patient like this already helps you not to give you a diagnosis. I mean, there's usually not a diagnosis in, in cases like this, uh, <coughs> but at least it gives you a severity. This is something completely different than um, a patient with only this. Do you use yeah. a modeling score? Uh, no, yeah. no. Uh, um I had a question for you, and it is the same. In fact, do you use this to see if your uh, therapeutic intervention will improve, saying that you come from five to four to three to two? Do we need this, or just the visualization of the skin is, is enough? What do you think? I think that nobody used this, in fact. The, no, the score, I don't think. No, I, I mean, think. We, we don't write down in notes that the modeling score yeah. was four or five. Um, but as a visualization, if I see a full leg that's blue, I'm much more startled and, um, let's say, anxious than when it's only a knee. Does anyone do this? I mean, in your observation, do you look at the extent of the discoloration? Did you report it on the medical file or something? No. No. Yeah, but meningococcal sepsis has another component, and that's diffuse intravascular coagulation. And so you see these confluent areas of the dark uh, blue, dark red um, uh, areas, uh, which is diffuse intravascular coagulation. Um, we did a, a case study with Maurizio Ciaconi a few days ago, um, and I asked the audience, how can you discriminate between sympathetic um, uh, activation and so uh, constrictive limitation of skin perfusion and diffuse intravascular coagulation because that's an easy diagnosis because if you have diffuse intravascular coagulation there is a different diagnosis by def almost by definition if you see the dif diffuse intravascular coagulation it's not septic shock it's, it's not cardiogenic shock, it's not tamponade, it's not hypovolemic shock. They don't present as diffuse intravascular coagulation. So if you can make the diagnosis, uh, <clears throat> this is DIC, then by definition you have sepsis. So how do you discriminate? I think the Netherlands is the only crazy country doing it. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, at Columbia University we have 
finally, uh, it took me five years to convince them that this is a safe procedure, but... I would push on the skin and see if I can... Yeah, that's, that's one thing, but if there is hardly any perfusion, uh, the reperfusion is also extremely limited. So that there's a, um, if, if in, in an area you have reperfusion, or even slow reperfusion, you know there is an open capillary, so it, it helps, but the easiest way, and it also demonstrates the area, is... And, and what do you put on it? Heat. Heat, yeah. Oh yeah, nurses love heat. So <laughs> they always start putting heat on, yeah. Um, that's a way, but it takes time. It takes time, but that's, that's one element. Uh, not always very effective, but in Raynaud syndrome, if you want to distinguish Raynaud from, let's say, shock uh, limited peripheral perfusion, then heat works great. Um, makes a huge difference. No, it's nitroglycerin. So if you push a little bit of nitroglycerin, what you see is the edges of your diffuse intravascular coagulation, so basically your soon-to-be dead area will be right red, uh, 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 bright red, and the area will have the same uh, uh, color. So there will be no change in color in the um, obstructed area and only the edges and so what you can then do you can draw with the with a pen the edges because it's bright red it's uh, identifiable and then you start your treatment heparin or whatever you want to do for DIC and you can mark whether it's improving simple how do you use it? sorry no, no, I, I, I dissolve one milligram in 20 ml syringe, and then you push one milliliter, and then you wait, you push one milliliter, yeah, IV. And if you have severe DIC, you can push one milligram, two milligram, three milligram, nothing happens. But you have an septic shock, sometimes you have a problem. No. 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 Okay. no. <laughs> No, because you use an extremely low dose, there's hardly, and I mean, these patients are uh, in a very significant sympathetic tone. And so with a small dose of nitroglycerin, you hardly change anything. You only have effect on the microcirculation, so the venous offloading of your microcirculation. So it's a very safe procedure. I, I do it regularly. In the United States, I have to use a trick. In the United States, I have to use a trick because they don't allow you to push nitroglycerin. So I ask for a nitroglycerin infusion because there's heart failure. And when there's in a rapid team, there's always a pharmacologist. And, and so you show them the lag and you said, this is severe heart failure. And you look very concerned. And then they prepare nitroglycerin and then I take it from the back. <laughs> okay. And the other thing is, and, and um, because for all of this, I mean, all of this stuff, um, we don't have any evidence that if you do it, it will benefit the patient. Um, this uh, capillary refill time has been used by pediatrics uh, because they have no arterial lines, they have no uh, access, they ha don't have a lot of parameters, so <coughs> the pediatricians we're very uh, regularly using peripheral perfusion to have an, uh, a measure of how is my patient doing. And so <coughs> it's a very simple test. You press on the index finger for 10 seconds. Uh, then you release and you count one, two, three, the seconds it takes for the color to become, uh, let's say, like baseline. That's, of course, extremely subjective. Uh, Alex Lima, who started all of this research as uh, one of my uh, PhD students, uh, found that <clears throat> whatever you use, um, uh, more or less, it's, it's all giving you the same number. Whether you use near-infrared, capillary refill time, whether you feel, um, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But if you want to use this in a study, you get into trouble because if I see, and, and that's a very big confounder, if I see a terribly ill patient, and I do capillary refill time, I will be like 
21, 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prolonged. Well, if uh, if I see a a not so sick patient, you do one, two, three. Oh yeah. It's a, so there is there is a bias. And so when we developed the Andromeda study, we had a huge. Uh, a discussion on how do we, let's say, limit all this extreme bias that you can introduce if you, if you see a bad patient and you press a finger. And that's why we use this. Um, so this is for Andromeda 2 that started last week, but the um, capillary refill time is done the same. And so what we said, the okay, we, we first need time, time so use your two, phone. A stopwatch and a microscope slide. And a glass. The technique used is simple. The pad of the index finger of the right hand is compressed with a slide until the capillary bed is bloodless and the compression is maintained for 10 seconds. Subsequently, the pressure is released and the time necessary for the flesh to recover its previous color is timed. A capillary refill time greater than three seconds is considered abnormal. Now let's look at two examples. In this first example, capillary refill occurs in normal time. In this second example, the capillary refill time is delayed. And uh, as you can see in this example, the, the exact time where you think, okay, this is normal temperature is also, let's say, still. It's still open for bias because normal, almost normal, uh, um, still not normal is still a very subjective assessment. But at least you have uh, seconds and then, of course, you have the problem is uh, 2.9 seconds, something completely different than 3.1? No, of course not. But if, if you do studies, I mean, it's impossible to have a range of, of normality. That will be uh, way too complex. So there is evidence that if you use this to resuscitate your patient, that the patient might benefit. We have to prove it in Andromeda 2, but in Andromeda 1, it seemed that if you, drove, uh, if you drive the patient to a normal capillary refill time, um, and then stop resuscitating, and not the blood pressure. You, you keep resuscitating the blood pressure with the vasopressor, but if your capillary refill time is normal, you can stop fluids. We have now recruited um, uh, two patients in Andromeda 2, the follow-up study, um, and the first patient was, uh, had a normal capillary refill time after one liter of fluid, and they stopped resuscitating, whatever the lactate was or the blood pressure. And if you're not happy with the blood pressure, you give norepinephrine. Um, so it's a very simple way of resuscitation, unless the capillary refill time doesn't uh, respond to your treatment. Um, but using this um, peripheral perfusion index, um, there is some evidence um, that um, the patient might benefit. There's much more in peripheral circulation that we don't use anymore. And I think we, we, we lost a lot of information, and Jacques did a lot of studies on this. Uh, this is near-infrared and this is hypovolemia in healthy volunteers, and you see this relationship between near-infrared and uh, so peripheral perfusion and, and hypovolemia, progressive hypovolemia, and also this vascular reactivity. I mean, haven't you seen patients where you give 0.1 norepinephrine, nothing happens, 0.15, nothing happens. Uh, with this uh, uh, vascular reactivity, and Jacques will explain, uh, you could have a sense of how the patient is improving over time. Yes, how much time do you have? Two minutes. Five. 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 five minutes, okay. So you want to, uh, uh, I explained the vascular occlusion test. So we put the near infrared spectroscopy on the hand, so the uh, tena eminence muscle here. And what we measure is the tissue oxygenation. And when we block the circulation, so you have a decrease in the STO2, when you release the cuff, you have, you know, 
this kind of overshoot here, which is the hyperhemia. And we postulate that the hyperhemia, the, the, the degree of hyperhemia is correlated to, let's say, the uh, um, ability to the microcirculation to recruit capillaries due to the ischemic, uh, ischemic insult. And uh, it, it's non-invasive, it's easy to do. Uh, many groups have done this in Europe and in the United States with clearly the same results, so it seems to be really reliable. Um, and of course, this slope, when you are in sepsis of, or any microcirculatory alteration, of course, this slope is not so high like this, so the slope decreases. So you can uh, assess it. I think that even the, uh, the, the company has developed a, uh, a software to calculate um, the, the, the slope automatically. So you have online, it's very easy to do, and it takes uh, two or three minutes to do, uh, to, to do that. So it, it can be uh, helpful. The, the idea also to, to try, uh, I, I remind you, let, let's say basic phys physiology is that if you measure the flow at the skin, it's important because as you know, this is the, the skin is, is very, uh, is sacrificed very early during sepsis. So it can be, you know, an alert, very, very rapid alert. And on the other hand, we know that even if you correct the uh, systemic hemodynamic variable, you can still have some um, uh, thing of malperfusion at the skin. So, uh, so that's why it's it's easy access. It's non-invasive, and, and and it will react, let's say, very rapidly due to systemic hemodynamic uh, change. And, and I have another question for Yann because the CRT is, of course, also non-invasive, easy to do. But do we have to correct it for, uh, for the age, for uh, pathologies like diabetes or something like that? So you always say it's three seconds. If I am 70 years old, it's not four or five or... No. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important discussion we had because basically you should. Yeah. Uh, because the normal value for elderly patients is more than three seconds. And so basically, um, I, I think what we're doing in the study is we're overcompensating a little bit the, the more elderly patient. They, we get them probably in a much more hyperdynamic state than the young patients who are in a hyperdynamic state by themselves. Um, and so there might be a little bit of overcorrection in the elderly, but at, at the end of the day, uh, it seems not to harm them. And, and because it's very difficult to, uh, let's say, introduce if the patient has diabetes, hypertension, you have to, uh, to adjust your, your normality of capillary refill time. That's way too complicated. I mean, doctors don't like complicated stuff. Everybody has to have in pocket a phone and a microscope slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to work in the emergency department. <laughs> well, right. you know, when we went through the review uh, uh, process at JAMA, uh, of course, the first uh, um, uh, draft that we sent was optimistic. I mean, the p-value is 0.07, but there is a significant, uh, let's say, message here. And Derek Anger said, no, 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 my friend, you cannot do that. This is a negative study, so you have to write that this is negative. Capillary refill doesn't help. And so we changed it a little bit. And he said, no, 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 you're still over-interpreting the results. And he later told us they had an um, a, um, a editorial board meeting. And the chief, uh, uh, the editor-in-chief of JAMA said, but this is a depressing paper. I get very depressed. There is, there is some value in this, no? And uh, Derek said, yeah, but I mean, this is the statistics. And so we had to write an editorial. And Derek later told me every, uh, every one of my fellows and residents is walking around with a glass and his iPhone and doing capillary refill time. So even though he was extremely negative, um, it changed practice. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't carry around the slide. I, I do the old stuff with my finger. Um, because at the end of the day, if the patient, or, or just warm, that's what um, uh, Alex Lima started with in Rotterdam. <clears throat> so we asked the, uh, the treatment team, are you done? Is the patient stable? You're finished? And they said, yes, we're waiting for recovery. And then Alex went in and he did this. Observe, this, not this. This is how you feel the temperature, with the dorsal side of your hand. So Alex walked in and did this, and then he wrote down normal, abnormal. And then he walked out and he said, not good. And so the team came to me like, who's this crazy guy from Sao Paulo? I mean, what's he doing? He's telling us not good, but the patient is fine. 
uh, when Alex went in and said, not good, half of the patient died. Um, that was the initial study. Uh, and so, crazy guy from Sao Paulo, not good. Um, he was right in, in half of the patient. So, I, I, I don't use numbers, but I use the assessment. Final remark, Jack. No, just to, if you have one or two questions, and after that, I promise you we will finish because <laughs> we are out of time. Any question or comments on this? To so who is going to do peripheral no. perfusion as of next week when you see your patient? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a little bit of success. Yeah, Thank okay. you very much. Thank Jacques. you.